We are right on time. In case you're wondering, those watching live on Facebook, it is six minutes after the hour. Welcome to Gardeners. Everybody tuned in? Even those who like to tune in. Hold on. There we go. Turn my audio off on my laptop. Hey, uh, welcome to those uh, Gardeners really tuned in. really odd that you would do something like Can that. Can I do my intro? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, let's take two. Good morning. Welcome to Garden America. Off to a great start. You can tell what kind of show it's going to be today. Target Palafox, I'm Brian Maine. John Bagnasco, the Hall of Famer. I feel like Joe Buck. Every time Joe Buck does a football game with Troy Aikman, he goes, I'm Joe Buck, and I'm with the Hall of Famer, Troy Aikman. Yeah, we know he's the Hall of Famer. So from now on, it's going to be John Bagnasco, the Hall of Famer. Hey, you know, Carla in Huntington Beach says that uh, she's fogged in up there. And we've got plenty of fog down here, too. Uh, very soupy this morning. Right. Reminds me of my days as a paper ad when I was 10 years old and, and delivering my papers on my bike scared to death because it was dark at 4 in the morning. And you were on the freeway. A couple of times. Yeah, that's a problem. Anyway, she says, but it's okay. She's got coffee and Garden America. That's right. We welcome all of you, even those who don't necessarily garden, but you just like to tune in and stare at us. Don't forget those. to turn the clocks back tonight. You Kathy know, reminds that? us Anda was in the newsletter. What about this whole turning the clocks back thing? I kind of like getting up you get in the morning extra... and it's it's pitch dark at 7 o'clock. But you get an extra hour of sleep. What are you going to do with your extra hour? I, You know, in the past, I, I used to save that hour and maybe use it two weeks later when I really needed it. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to save it this year. I'm going to use it tomorrow. I used to turn the clocks around until somebody said, no, you don't. That's, that's not, not what they mean. That's not what they're talking about. No. We get the extra hour tomorrow, which is great on a Saturday night. Right. You know what? And if you've got a, a, a smartphone, it miraculously, it changes by itself. So does Alexa. Really? Oh, yeah. A lot of these clocks, even here in the studio, they're, based, they're atomic clocks. Now, if you've got a battery-operated clock, you can just go behind and move the dials, right? You'll have to show me how to do that. And if you've got a uh, microwave, I just get out the directions. It'll tell you how to do it. But on your car, it's best to just wait six months. <laughs> not, not, not to change the subject too drastically, John, already two or three people say we missed the weekly plant that we normally have right here. You started a trend and you bailed on us. I was going to bring something, but first of all, it was a, a heavy plant week for me. Yeah. I got... I probably got about 25, 30 new plants. And plants that you forgot that you even ordered. Some were, right, and some people sent to me. I got a China fur tiger. What's that? A cunning hamia. I don't know how well it'll do, but <laughs> I got the Glocka variety. Because it's not necessarily for this zone? Is that yeah, why you're maybe. questioning? Yeah, maybe. It might be a little bit too hot. But uh, cunning hamia is related to, it's in the Oracaceae family. So it's uh -oh. related to Norfolk Island pines. Okay, and I like those. Things like that. My wife bought two Norfolk Island pines. How about that? When was this? Did it she, shows you what a heavy plant it was at my house. That did she, she just bought show up with these? Yeah, she yeah. got them at Walmart. <laughs> I love it. I feel, like, I feel like that is the equivalent to a normal family person just showing up with some kind of uh, like animal pet, like unannounced. Like showing, showing up with a random plant to John, you know, who is the plant's man. Something that he would not expect. Yeah, exactly. Well, she wanted to, to I guess, put ornaments on them and stick them out front. In the urns? Yeah, in right, the urns. Right, you do the urns? Right, for, okay. for Christmas. Yeah, makes a good point. Okay, she's not expecting yeah. you to plant them in yeah. the landscape. She was also not area. expecting. They were in uh, some kind of decorative bag. and mm. So, you know, she paid extra for the marketing, right? <laughs> So she asked me, how much do you think those cost? And I go, well, they're pretty small, uh, $5.99. <laughs> she goes, $9.99. I thought that was a good deal. Uh, anyway, bring the plants back, John, the weekly plants. All right. Well, you know, you guys can bring something in, too. Yeah. I, yeah, you know what? That's true. There you go. I transplanted the camellias, by the way. Nice. Yeah, looking good. You got camellias? Yes, from Tiger. Really? Or plumerias. What, what? No, camellias. Oh, camellias. Yeah. When did you give them camellias? Two, two weeks ago. You brought them in. And you said, hey, you want to take these home? Oh. I'm like, sure. It's like bringing a cat into the studio. You want to take them <laughs> home? Yeah, sure, I'll take them home. Were I'll feed them. You brought them camellias? What was that? Camellia? Isn't it nice to be over 40? Yeah. You can't remember <laughs> things. I remember I brought you plants, and I said, yeah, do you want You them? brought it in here. It was, yeah. it was one of the weekends we brought plants in, right. kind of show and tell. And you just said, here, take this home. You want them? And it was in a small little pot, five inch maybe. Yeah. And I took it home. I used the soil, planted it, and they're happy. Never seen a camellia in a five-inch pot ever. 
Yeah, I'm trying to think of what it it's was. Little. It wasn't a camellia. You sure? Yeah. Well, I have camellias anyway. It was in the house plant. And it was red. They're pink, kind of reddish pink. It was in the house plant. The um cyclamen. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? You remember you John? Don't now? Even you know. remember I brought yeah. in that really unique cyclamen? Right. I gave that one. That if you too. looked at the back of it, yep. it yeah, had some kind of splotches on it. I don't think that was it. Isn't it nice I'm being take over pictures. 40? <laughs> I can't remember things. It's nice Selected. to be over 65. <laughs> yeah, exactly, not being able to remember. Anyway, welcome. We're off to a decent start today. We should kind of set the stage for what's going to be happening today. A lot little, of stuff. little A little different stuff. show than normal. Yeah. Oh, you know, we're going to have uh, Rosarian. Greg Lowry is going to be our guest today. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about... Uh, Going on right now is the Save the Roses auction. If you go to ccrsauction.com, you can see all the roses being offered. And if you're listening to the show on the radio, the uh, auction ends Sunday, so you can still go and get in your bids if you want. But you can start putting in bids right now. And uh, Greg is going to talk about some of his favorite roses that are in the auction. And he says that one area of roses he really likes are the old hybrid teas. So mm. he'll be talking about some of those, putting up pictures. And if uh, any of our listeners like that particular rose, you can go ahead and bid on it. So you'll see the rose. You'll get some background on the rose. Right. If you like the rose, you can buy the rose. You can bid on the rose, right? Exactly. All that happening today. How do we do it? Volume. And if you have any questions for Greg, uh, sure. you're more than happy. I mean, Greg is, and I'm not exaggerating, probably one of the most knowledgeable rose people in the entire world. How about that? And <laughs> and if that's too yeah, much of an exaggeration, at least Sebastopol where he lives. Exactly. So that's all happening today here, a little yeah. different uh, twist. And I do want to remind those that uh, listen to our show on BizTalk Radio, which is a one-week uh, pre-recorded broadcast. You can always watch us live. If you want to interact with the show, go to our garden, uh, our page, our Facebook page, that is, Garden America Radio Show. And you can watch, like a lot of you are doing right now, interact with us, questions, comments. And a good example would be today as we discuss roses and actually show the roses themselves. I didn't get a quote of the week about roses, and I should have. No, you know what, though? It's a good quote anyway. I liked it. It's timely, right? It's timely, and you know, it's something I think we can all identify with. Yeah, and the quote is... I cannot endure to waste anything so precious as autumnal sunshine by staying in the house. Yeah, get out there. And that was, and he had a house of seven gables. Still didn't <laughs> want to stay in it. I've only seen two gables at the most. Well, Clark Gable in my and life. Who else? And Betty <laughs> and Betty Grable, not uh, the same. No, Gable, but it's Grable. close. <laughs> it's close. It's close. That I guess it counts. Anyway, that was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yep. Hey, we've got a, a, a great uh, YouTube page, our YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. Watch any show you want to. In fact, most usually after this show, it's posted within an hour or so, or by the end of Saturday afternoon, this show is posted. You can go and watch previous shows at uh, our YouTube channel. And, it, and, and you know they're going to be good videos because this is a business for us, this, which, means, right. which means that you know we do this for a living, Right. So we're going to put out great information that's going to make you succeed, and you're going to do wonderful things. Right. And as John has said on numerous times, if you don't watch or listen to our show, you are doomed for failure. <laughs> it's your own fault. <laughs> and it's your own fault if you don't watch us, because like Tiger says, it's a business. We take this seriously. Hey, we got an. Speaking of seriously, we got an answer to the cyclamen camellia question. Oh, do we? Well, yeah. Uh, I, I saw Dana's comment. Yeah, Dana says, Brian doesn't know what he has on our <laughs> patio anymore. It's out of hand. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. It's very <laughs> random out there. Very <laughs> random. All I know is you don't have a condo mango. Yeah. That's the only thing Dana's ever asked you for. <laughs> no, it's not. She says for a lot of things. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but do I deliver? That's oh. that's the next thing. Yeah. All right, so this show is going to be fun. Uh, I would uh, strongly urge you to pour another cup of coffee, uh, sit back, relax, check out the, um, oh, boy, look at Greg. Oh, no, I'm doomed for failure. Uh -oh. oh, Greg, is no, you're not. that his way of saying that he would never but, um, listen to us otherwise? Yeah. But if you, are, if you are listening to this program, I do want to uh, let everybody know that uh, we will be posting the pictures of roses that we're going to be talking about. So you're going to want to have... The computer screen, tablet screen, laptop screen, right. uh, in eyesight, 
So that way, when we right. mention a rose, if you want to see it, we're going to have pictures of roses on there. And for those of you that are listening on the radio, if you can you, go back, right? You, yeah, exactly. If you would like to see some of the roses that we're talking about, um, you can go to our Facebook page, go to prior shows, and this show will be posted I think by the you time can, you're listening to if it. If you forget, just go to GardenAmerica.com, right? Yeah, yeah. that's and another place all, to go. Right, all the old shows are there. And as we mentioned, uh, go to our YouTube channel as well to, to watch this show, previous shows, and uh, definitely check out some of the roses. So that in mind, uh, the old clock says it's time for our first break. Segment one is over. Those on BizTalk Radio are going to hear some messages. Uh, Facebook Live, we're going to get a hold of Greg and uh, get the train out of the station, as they say. Pull it out of the station and head on down the tracks, John. Get your phone. Give them a call. I'm going to give them a call. All right. So with that in mind, we're going to take a break and remind you that you are listening to Garden America. Right after these messages, we're coming back on BizTalk Radio and Facebook Live. As promised, we have returned from the break, and we are, as always, Garden America. John Bagnasco, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, having a good time. Those on Facebook Live, make sure you have your screen in front of you. As Tiger mentioned, I distance, so you can check out some of these roses. As we, uh, as I said, uh, the train has pulled out of the station, and we are rolling down the tracks, Tiger. Uh, let's continue, shall we, with Greg? Yeah, this morning we're chatting, as John said, with Greg Lowry from um, the... Friends of Vintage Gardens. Friends of Vintage Gardens. Right. And we're going to be talking about some of the roses that are going to be up for auction um, with the um, California Coastal R Rose, Rose Society. Society. 21st I'm, annual auction. Sorry, I've been plugging in all these acronyms <laughs> for the Facebook thing right now. and I'm Got CCRS. Yeah, and... all these things. But I did post a link to the auction website on our Facebook live feed, so if you are Listening to the radio or watching on Facebook Live, there's a link that lists all the roses that are up for auction currently. Um, Greg, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Hey, good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing really, really well. Greg, how, Greg's how, excited. He's excited to be here. Well, you know, talking about roses, how can you not be doing well? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Greg, how's it going up where you're at at the moment? Great. We've had... Uh... Uh, almost 14 inches of rain since wow. rain began up here, and that's uh, half of what our our annual norm would be. Wow, which is that really, is a lot. Really exciting. Yeah. yeah, and we've had three inches down here again, which, half which is, of our <laughs> norm. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's true. in the last five years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, we're really lucky that Greg's able to join us because right after he's done with us, uh, he has another talk. He has a sale going on up at his nursery. Greg, maybe you can, I'm sure Tiger was going to ask you this, but give us a little background on what the Friends of Vintage Roses does. Uh, well, we are a, um, a nonprofit that formed around the collection that I put together over 30 years or so, of uh, roses, mostly heritage roses. Hmm. And our purpose is to try to find ways to make these things continue into the future for people to grow and, and appreciate and make a part of gardens in the future and to keep a bit of history alive. Yeah, and that's the same thing that we try to accomplish yeah. with the uh, Save the Roses auction. We've right. been do, doing it for 21 years now, and a lot of it with Greg's support. So thank you for that, Greg. My pleasure. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on talking about some of these roses that you um, have picked out that are in the auction this year, Greg. Um, yeah. You have your list in front of you? I do. All right, perfect. So I'll let you go ahead and introduce them, and then I'll kind of follow along. And maybe let us know why you picked this particular list out mm -hmm. of 170 roses. <laughs> You know, uh, the simple answer to that is um, your most recent uh, additions to your list included a lot of a lot of these roses. 
Um, and I was really excited to see that finally the the railroads auction was going to have a real large number of historic hybrid tea roses, which are really on the brink of disappearing. So I thought it was a good time to talk about the whole group of hybrid tea roses. Um, and I, what I essentially, if you, if you all think about it as about 100 years, from sometime in the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century um, is, is this period of extraordinary expansion of roses and gardens to the point that by the time we got to the 1950s, everybody in, in, in our country had an opportunity to have a garden and to plant roses and came to understand the joy of gardening and the joy of to be found in the beauty of color, um, to be surrounded by color, um, to have a part of that connection with color that is that is the, the basic human connection uh, with life. So uh, that said, um, the hybrid teas are are a kind of offshoots of a whole bunch of work that was done in the early 19th century. Um, by largely by French and to some degree English and Italian rose breeders, um, trying to bring repeat bloom into the roses that were known in European gardens, which largely just bloomed in the spring. And um, enormous numbers of roses were were raised in this effort from uh, trying to breed uh, the old China roses and tea roses that had been brought in from China. Europe. Um, at the beginning, uh, by the middle of the 19th century, the rebloom factor was well established. And so this group of smaller shrub roses, the hybrid tea roses, were fragrant like the old European roses. They were, um, they had subtle coloring like many of the old China and tea roses, and they bloomed and bloomed and bloomed. By the end of this 100-year cycle in the 1950s, there was this period of incredible stagnation in which thousands of roses were introduced, but virtually only one new thing was added to roses, and that was the dark eye in the center of the flower um, in roses like the iconic series that we know today. And that came from a a uh, 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 Middle Eastern rose, Rosa Fessida Persiana, the form called Austrian copper, which has yellow flowers with a dark, um, bright crimson, um, um, scarlet reverse to the tone. So this period of time starts with hybrid teas that are a lot like the old uh, Portland roses and the old damask roses and the hybrid perpetuals that were being raised that rebloomed in the early 19th century. Um, and um, they looked a lot like a hybrid perpetual. And in fact, it's really unclear when hybrid teas actually began to be. It really is just a name that was slapped on uh, posthumously to roses from the 1860s. 60s. And that was how La France came to be known as the first hybrid tea. So the hybrid teas are largely um, influenced by the early bourbon roses um, that have flowers that are quite similar in growth habit and foliage that's quite similar to hybrid teas. In fact, the Chinese, a thousand years ago, developed roses that look just like our early hybrid teas, um, derived um, from species that existed in China for thousands of years, were grown by the Chinese. So, so much for hybrid teas being modern roses. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, only a thousand years. So how does um, Betty, is it Up Richard? It's actually pronounced Betty Youp Richard. Youp Richard right, fit into there, Betty. Greg. That's right. Yeah, Betty Youprichard. Youprichard, okay. That's how the British actually say it now. Oh, okay. Um, Hey, and Greg, so, I just want to let you know, we got about 30 seconds left. We're going to have to take a, curse, uh, a quick break. So if you just want to do a quick intro right now, and then when yeah, we get back from break, we'll bring it finish on. it up, just letting you know. So Betty, Betty Uprichard is uh, a bicolor rose, dark on the reverse of the petals and light on the inside. It was introduced in the early 19th century by the Dixon family in Ireland. And it's often called a Pernetiana, 
and I'll talk about those. That group when we come back. Later. Perfect. Beautiful. Good job on the timing, Greg. And again, uh, you are tuned in to Garden America. We're just getting started now with some of the roses going to be in the California Coastal Rose Society, the auction. Save the roses, so stay with us. Keep the computer handy. Keep it in front of you. Uh, those on Biz Talk Radio, this is a pre-recorded show from last week. We'll explain them how you can get involved as the show does progress. Stay with us. We're just getting to our first rose. We're going to take a break. This is Garden America. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. Welcome back to the show, Garden America on BizTalk Radio. Of course, Facebook Live. We are so happy that you have tuned in this morning. A special show with Greg Lau. We were talking roses. And, of course, you're going to see those roses as you are right now. Uh, Betty, how do you say that, John? Betty? You Prichard is what Greg says. Betty, you Prichard. Okay, and that's the rose that we have and, as we right. kick things off. And Greg was going to, uh, prior to the break, was going to let us know what a Pernettiana was. That's right. Well, they're kind of the crowning glory of um, rose breeder um, uh, expertise and, and years of sweat and tears. And essentially, um, roses up until the turn of the century in Europe, um, except for a few wild roses that came from the Far East, were um, not hot colors. No oranges, no bright scarlets. Um, and not even really warm salmony pinks. Um, and the breeders were really trying to get yellow, particularly into true yellow into roses. Um, and uh, one French breeder, uh, Joseph Pernet Duché, created one of the first of that type. And they immediately became the darlings of, of the rose world. And breeders in the early uh, 1900s uh, introduced Hundreds and hundreds. They were very popular in Cal- in, in California at the time as well. Um, so we're going to look at, we're going to see some of them. We can go to the next um, image, which is a rose called Christopher Stone. And uh, Christopher Stone is a, an English bred rose from uh, 1935. It's one of the early roses with a really true scarlet color. That's there beautiful. There he is. Yeah, it's almost a glowing color. That's beautiful, yeah. Very glowing. It actually begins a really rich, deep red um, and with a beautiful form. It's very fragrant. Uh, it's small compared to modern standards of, of hybrid teas, but almost all of these roses don't compare to the giant post-piece roses. Hey, and then um, I, real quick, Greg, I just want to mention, um, just to give some people some information about the auction, uh, Christopher Stone is currently at nine dollars in the auction, and then um, you can have well, we that char- shipped. We, we charge twenty dollars for it here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. So. <laughs> and you can have that shipped, um, you know, wherever you are in the country. Um, now, also to give you perspective on the prior rose, um, Betty, it's at twenty five dollars currently. So, so okay. just to give some people some information, if you are interested in these uh, roses. Um, if you go to the website right now, you can see the auction price, what it currently is at. And if you are in a cold climate and you would like us to hold the rose until spring shipping, uh, I'll be happy to do that for you. Wow. All right. How about that? Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to get some a little bit of information in there, Greg. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Sure. No, no. Great. Great. Excellent. Um, uh, personally, I would pay $50 for Christopher Stone, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> All right, do you want to change that bid from $9 to $50? Yeah, we're, yeah we're up you to heard 50. it here. Somebody want to go 55 Let's go 55 Come on. Okay, so uh, in, in the course of this, we're going to go through these roses fairly briskly. Yep. Um, but I just wanted people to have an overview. And there's two things that we're going to be seeing over and over again because these are mixed up from the earliest to the, to the 1940s. We have... Fragrance is a major factor, and fragrance starts to disappear after 1950. Um, mm-hmm. And and we also have and, and different kinds of fragrance, from the old fragrance to the Pernettiana scent, which is a very interesting fragrance. Um, and the other thing is color, from very soft, very um, 
pale uh, colors, which today are like the darlings of the florist industry. All of the, the small growers want these wonderful off, old soft shades of pink and cream. Those two things are going to happen again and again. So the next one that we're going to look at is um, a rose called Cuba. And Cuba is another of the Pernetiana roses. And you'll, and you'll see that right away in the color of the flower. It's, it's this intense scarlet, orangey uh, color. Um, Cuba is um, a small flower with maybe a dozen or so petals, incredibly fragrant. And it's the first that I know of that, that offered this amazing fruity damask blend of fragrance that the Pernetianas are so famous for. If you don't grow one of these Pernetiana roses, you, you will never experience this fragrance, which is really superb. Especially in California, you should be yeah. trying it. And I would say if you're inland, um, it's they love hot weather, at least in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. So our next rose is a rose called Dame Edith Helen. And she's a, a, a 19... 26 um, hybrid tea that is very much like the earlier hybrid teas of the La France area from the 1860s and 70s, but with more petals and a more perfect kind of form. And and you can see that exquisite crown-like effect that the flowers make. She probably has 60 to 80 petals, typically. Um, The flowers are a good size, very fragrant, and there's also a climbing form of Damien of Helen, which is killer. So on the is that they just do they put it on a different rootstock for a climbing version? Climbers are are, are uh, mutations or sports from a bush form of a rose. So and and it came about with the hybrid perpetuals, which often tend to put very long climb long canes up that um, can be trained in the spalliers and so forth. So if you have a climbing sport and you take cuttings from that, you'll always have climbers. Keep going. Right. Yeah. Until you it, end up with the Kipskate rose. I have to tell you that <laughs> yeah, you don't want anything like a Kipskate rose. Um, <laughs> Dame Edith Helen has always been one of my favorite roses. And, Brian, I know you collect rose cards. It's <laughs> one of the uh, – There's. I have a cigarette rose card that I'd be willing to trade for you. Is maybe it 1916? To, no, it was the nineteen twelve. Nineteen twelve version. So I would trade it maybe for three other rose cards. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you lemon. I'll give you one lemon spice. Uh, lemon spice is way too too uh, new. Too new. Okay. Right. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. The next rose that we have listed, Greg, I believe is is General. Is Bertolo. It? Bertolo. All right. And and uh, General Bertolo is a, a French rose from nineteen twenty six. Um, it's it's also one of the um, Pernetianas, similar to Cuba, but a, a lighter, more orangey shade. And that orange continues to be more and more prominent in the breeding of these roses. Um, what's really special about this particular variety is that um, we received this from Sangerhausen, from the Great Rose Nurse uh, Rose Garden in Germany, about 30 years ago. Um, as far as I know, we lost our plant. Um, as far, or it may have been one of the ones that we sent to uh, CCRS and John for um, growing on and curating. But it's one of the rarest roses you could actually buy uh, anywhere in the world today. Wow. Very fragrant. Uh, a lovely small shrub, great for a small garden. Yeah, what's the bid on that, Tiger? I'll find out in a second. Yeah. You know, um, the picture that uh, Greg sent us that Tiger has posted online now, it looks like the sun is shining on the petals. It does. It's a reflection. Right, which is probably what's happening. But on some of these old roses, you get, when you see the blooms, you get this glowing effect that just attracts your eye immediately. And you've got to go look and see what's going on. Mm-hmm. So the date on the General Bertolo Rose is 1926, and it's at a $15 bid right now. And, and you say, Greg, it's very hard to find and very rare? It, it's probably on the verge of extinction. It's, it's that rare. And that price, it's, that bidding price is unbelievable. It's no longer in Sangerhausen's collection. and They had a hard time keeping the Pernetianas alive. And uh, we, 
uh, we in the San Jose Heritage Roses together um, received their collection of Perennialia roses about 25 years ago. Wow! Wow! All right. So it's it's something to be preserved, and if you if you bid on this, you're bidding bidding on saving something for the future. Definitely, and we are going to have to take another break here in about a minute, Greg. The next rose up. I just want to give a disclaimer for people yeah. watching on Facebook Live. I was only able to fit General Superior on my uh, picture <laughs> of the rose. But, Greg, go ahead and give us the full name. <laughs> it's uh, General Superior Arnold Jansen. Yes. The Germans went in for really long names. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and this actually, this is from a Dutch breeder, but um, it's in that, in that sort of tradition. Uh, 1912. A very early Pernidiana rose, not quite as brilliant as uh, actually. It's going to come up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Greg, we we're going to take a quick break and then we'll we'll get started. Uh, Tiger's going to bring that up on the screen there. Hey, those on Facebook Live, absolutely glad you're with us. You can see all these roses. I know we have uh, maybe a question or two, which we will get to, but we want to keep rolling with these roses with Greg. Going to take a quick break on uh, Facebook Live, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. Do stay with us. I'm Brian Main, John Bagnasco, Tiger Palafox, along with Rose expert Greg Lowry, coming back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. All righty, we are back. It is Facebook Live. It is BizTalk Radio. Hey, by the way, those on uh, BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment of hour number one. If you carry two hours of our show, which we hope you do, we return at six minutes after news coming up on most of these BizTalk Radio stations. In the meantime, we are back to Facebook Live and these great roses. Tiger with uh, Greg Lowry, our guest, uh, talking about some some fantastic deals, bidding. Uh, this is all happening, of course, the California Coastal Rose Society giving you a sneak preview. Yeah, and so thank you very much, Greg, for giving us insight on the roses that we have listed. And we were just talking about General Superior, and I'm not even going to attempt the second half. Arnold Jansen. <laughs> um, so give us some more information about this beautiful rose. Um, I think he was done. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's also extremely rare. There's one nursery in Germany that continues to carry this, um, it, and... Um, it, it, it's just a, it, it's a treasure. Um, you you will not find any neighbor in your, the rest of your life growing this rose, <laughs> and you'll be able to share the fragrance and the beauty of it with them. So now, uh, now on the um, ne next rose, though, I'm going to post that picture up. They look very similar in the pictures. Do you know? Or is Home Sweet Home very similar to the General Superior rose? Uh, no, but you you what you probably missed is the the titles on the photos. There actually were two oh. entries of the same photo of General Superior. Oh, okay. Arnold Jensen. Jensen. Um, but uh, um, there we go. That's the actual Home Sweet Home. Got yeah. it. And Home Sweet Home is um, a 1931 um, rose that is famous because, and, and important in, in, in my view of rose history, because it was one of the first of the modern hybrid tea roses that embraced the idea of the old-fashioned flower form. The flowers opening from this beautiful cup globular form to a multi-petaled uh, rose that we associate nowadays with Austin roses. But this is a true hybrid tea with intense fragrance and tending to bloom on, singly on stem. This is, it, in its day, was a very, very popular rose in America. All right. Um, we're going to move on to something that breaks the mold a little bit. Now, and which, that's the, the rose called Ibiza. And I saw two pictures of Ibiza. In the, I have them both. Which yeah. one should I start off with, the closed or the open? The closed. That's All a right. good one to start with. Um, uh, there's a Spanish breeder named Pedro Dot, And John can speak a little bit to this because he's working on a project that involves Pedro Dot roses. But Pedro Dot was a Spanish Catalonian breeder um, who bred some of the most magnificent hybrid teas ever introduced, and who continued this passion to discover wonderful warm colors in roses. Um, they make sense in a southern climate in some, some degree, and they do in California. Um, but uh, he, grew, he bred a lot of other, kind, other roses as well. And Ibiza was one of his favorites. It's a very fragrant, pure white rose 
that ages with a little bit of a sort of um, old ivory tone to it. Um, the second picture is really demonstrative of what this rose does, um, which is that it opens fully up and exposes the golden stamens in the center. Looks like a completely different rose. Yeah, very much. Um, yeah, look at that. Wow. It's a very rare rose. The name has been reused by the Dot family, I think grandson now, who's breeding, um, for a wonderful rose of hot coloring that is kind of typical of, of Pedro Dot's roses. But uh, Dot created a lot of um, pale, creamy colored roses and pale pink roses as well. Uh, Ibiza is, uh, it, it, it's not just endangered, it probably, it probably is not going to exist within a few years. Mm. Um, I just can't tell people how important it is to treasure these roses. When you buy, when you pay a crazy amount of money for a rare rose at an auction, you're paying for your own responsibility to take care of it and pass it on, and you get the satisfaction of doing that. So. I would bid fifty dollars on Ibiza, hands down. And now, you will not find it for sale. And now, John, when say so, say Ibiza was one of the last roses. The is the um, the Rose Society. Do they also have another Ibiza somewhere else, or are they literally selling the last rose? No, no. We we most of the roses Greg's talking about were roses that came from his collection. Mm -hmm that the California Coastal Rose Society is in charge of maintaining. And the roses from that collection that are in the auction, like Ibiza, are uh, either roses that we had budded up specifically for the auction or maybe separated uh, or started from a cutting. So we do have a mother plant yeah, still so no, available. So if you are getting the Ibiza rose, don't worry. It is not right. the last one in existence, but you are helping to further, you know, um, save more of them for the future. And then, but at the same time, I mean, does the Rose Society keep a little bit of a database about where the roses go in case maybe they need one in the future? We do. Yeah, yeah we perfect. do. And um, and it needs to go to the right person. I, I, you know, I can't imagine somebody saying, I'm going to bid on this for my little daughter. She's five years old and she's going to go out, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. you know. Well, it would be just like if you got your got your daughter a puppy. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. You you're, you're going to make sure that the puppy's still right. getting fed and water, <laughs> right? But but I think, Greg, I and love it. Tiger, yeah, bring yeah. up a good point. That, and you, John, the appreciation of what you're bidding on. There's a lot of roses that you can bid on. That, yeah, we got a lot of those. But when you look at, at roses like these um, and what they're going for, the bids, um, again, yeah. to the right person. And there, there's certain breeders that I think are, I mean, they're so famous or they've done such great work that they – you should learn about them in history classes. It, it, you yeah. know? Well, and it's like collecting a painting. So, for instance, right. this is like an early Picasso. This right. is an early Ping. You know. And if you whatever. can get a dot rose, um, you definitely should should get one. Yeah. I mean, I I think that if you were to see a collection of just dot roses, which is why I want to go to that garden near Barcelona sometime, <laughs> um, I think it would take your breath away. All right. Sorry to interrupt no, there, we, Greg. We've got about a minute to go, uh, Tiger, before our break, and then we'll come back So we back can introduce point. the next rose, sure. Greg. Yeah, and that's La Tosca. All right. And uh, Tosca is a turn-of-the-century rose from Vaux Schwartz, the widow Schwartz uh, of France, one of the most famous breeders in French history, one of the few women breeders. She you... was the head of a, a very important um, rose-breeding family. I think Brian dated the widow Schwartz at one time. <laughs> we don't need to dig up my history right now. We're talking about the history of roses, oh, John. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But that said, uh, we are just in time now for our uh, our break. We do have to uh, do a break here, Greg. So do stay with us. You're going to come right back. Hey, those on Biz Talk Radio News coming up top of the hour. Hour two coming up if you do carry our show six minutes after. Those watching on Facebook Live, thank you. A lot of people tuned in this morning. We're going to come right back after this break. This is Garden America for your Saturday morning, or maybe where you are Saturday afternoon here on Garden America. Brian Maine, John Bagnasco, or Tiger Palafox.
All righty, welcome back to the show from the break. Those on uh, BizTalk Radio, if you're uh, just tuning in, maybe this is the only hour you get. Uh, keep listening. We'll have more information on how you can take part in the Rose Auction. For the rest of us on Facebook Live, for the past uh, oh, 35, 40 minutes, we've been listening to Greg Lowry. Great history on these roses. And again, uh, the bidding coming up, California Coastal Rose Society. As we continue, I think we want to pick up where we left off, uh, Tiger, before the break. Yeah, and Greg was talking about La Tosca. Yeah, and if anybody, if, if there's any uh, opera buffs out there, this is your rose, folks. Um, La Tosca has been collected over the years by many, many people around the world who are lovers of opera. But it is an exquisite rose of great delicacy, very high-centered flowers, incredibly fragrant, with this, inc- this, this extremely subtle uh, blending of colors that... Um, Modern breeders don't really aim at that anymore. Subtlety, um, crafted uh, color blends are just not a part of it. Um, and, and not to say that what's done today is not good, but we like to have all of it. And this is a part that's kind of missing, I think. Now, the next one, yeah, um, the next one is, is a part of another group that I really want to talk about a bit. And that's Lady Sylvia. And there, is a, uh, there was a road called Ophelia, which was introduced at the turn of the century, roughly, um, a creamy white with a blush of pink, um, which became the darling of the uh, cut flower trade in America. At one time, Ophelia was being produced in the millions every year. Tens of millions of, of stems of Ophelia were sold in American flower markets. And... It was the rose that you would want to give to someone. Ophelia had a bunch of these mutations or sports that are slightly different in color. And I think the most beautiful of those is Lady Sylvia, which has this deep pink heart to the flower. The fragrance on the Ophelia group is divine. Um, If you don't grow an Ophelia type, Lady Sylvia, Madame Butterfly, Ophelia herself, Rapture, you need to. Good info. We Good info. Uh, move along. We're going to see some of those show up if we get further into this, but we're going to move along to a rose called Legion. And I need to queue up my pictures here. There we go. And then as we look at the uh, the screen here, it is about to show up. There Great. it is right there. Oh. There it is. Okay. Um I talked a little bit ago about uh, this uh, importation that we that came to us from the very famous gardens of roses in Sangerhausen, Germany. Um, and Legion was one of this group of what what they consider to be hybrid um, um, Prunetiana roses, the roses with this modern warm coloring. Um, this this is not the the true rose by that name, but we have no other name for it. It's Sangerhausen Legion. Um, it is a hybrid tea that probably dates from about 1910, uh, possibly 1900. Very, very fragrant with this wonderful, rich pink coloring. And onward, we'll, we'll move. Uh, before we do the next rose, we have a question on Facebook. Uh, somebody was uh, asking about the uh, disease resistance on some of these old roses. Um, they're not going to be like some of the modern roses that are completely disease resistant. Uh, do you have any comment on the diseases, Greg? I think uh, my comment is largely that uh, people obsess too much about disease. Um, there's a lot of hours I have to put in the day <laughs> to caring for my roses here. Um, I don't have time to spray roses. And the healthiest roses, those that you're mentioning, will get disease. Um, disease really is, is a microclimate thing, too. So right. um, no one can tell you what rose is going to be disease-free. On, on the whole, I find the early hybrid teas to be more disease-resistant than the roses, the hybrid teas from 1950 to, say, 1980. In the 80s and 90s, American breeders in particular, and French as well, began uh, really focusing on disease. And you know what they lost? They lost fragrance, and they didn't care. And I think people do care about fragrance. 
And sometimes we have to turn to roses that may not be ironclad as we'd like them to be. Hey, Greg, the, the first thing people do is yeah. they want to smell a rose, right? When you show them a that's rose, right. that's the first thing that's they right. do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's more depressing than somebody showing you their latest rose in the garden, which is gorgeous and has zero fragrance at all? Yeah. There's, it's kind of like there's something, there's a soul missing there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think common sense would tell you that if a rose has had enough strength to last over a hundred years, <laughs> it probably can survive any kind of uh, disease attack. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, we're going to miss out on some of these, and I'm going to have you, if you can, yep. uh, Tiger, flip forward to a few. But to mention Mammal Lily, um, this is considered to be one of the Pernetiana roses. It's not super hot in coloring. It's it's very pale, very very delicate, um, but it is an example of the range that the breeders who produce these hybrid, um, these Pernetiana type roses came up with. And essentially, even though the value of that color is very pale, it's actually a warm color. It's an orange that's, that's, that's thinned down to almost white. And that kind of color is really striking in, in the garden. It's a rather large bl- blossom also. Yes, it's a, a, a nice sized flower. Um, Mar- Maria Peral um, is more typical, and she's coming up now, of the Pernetiana type, which is very, very richly colored in shades of orange and yellow. And I love her. And um, we were really uh, fortunate to be able to, um, to uh, get this uh, from a collector about 20 years ago. It's um, one of Pedro Dot's roses that is among the rarest of all. Very, very few people in the world grow this rose. It's, it's, it has a rich, fruity fragrance. The flowers are quite nice size, um, and the, the color is vibrant, and yet not a dead orange, but a wonderful blended orange and pink. On to uh, one of my own personal treasures, <clears throat> which is a rose called Magretti's Ivory. Magretti refers to um, Sam Magretti and all the, the uh, sons and grandsons and great-grandsons that all were called Sam Magretti as well. Um, that was very convenient because you don't have to remember all these different people. They're just <laughs> Magretti. Um, <clears throat> the famous Irish breeder who moved to... Um, to uh, New Zealand during the period of the Troubles in, in Northern Ireland um, and um, has bred an amazing um, stable of roses. This was a rose from his grandfather, and uh, it's typical of the, the, the tenderness with which they selected their roses. Um, subtlety was really critical at that time to success in, in the first 25 or so years of the 20th century. So people really went for, for this soft ivory color. Nowadays, people are not particularly interested in white or even creamy. And especially creamy whites seem to be like um, they're not really yellow enough the way a lot of people look at them. I look at them as part of the spectrum that makes the, the garden beautiful. Um, we'll skip along to... Um, I don't know how quickly you can do this, but mm-hmm. I want to go up to Morgan Hill Red. Got it. And Morgan Hill Red is one of our found roses. We, we've discovered a lot of old roses growing in gardens all over the world, but particularly in California. Um, and this was discovered by a woman named Frances Great, who is one of the leaders of the Heritage Roses group up here, um, in a cemetery in Morgan Hill. Um, it um, It's this exquisite... Uh, kind of satiny uh, textured um, bright true red. It's, it's really a stunning rose. Beautiful high center buds, a very rich red rose fragrance to it. And that's my favorite scent of all because the damask fragrance takes part in that. Morgan Hill Red um, ha- had a revival uh, because of Francis taking cuttings and sharing them with people and then eventually getting into our nursery. Hey, Greg, I hate to interrupt you, though. I'm sorry about that. We're going to pick up where we left off. Got to take a quick break for our sponsors on BizTalk Radio. 
Uh, picking up where we uh, left off, Greg, we're going to come back very soon here, quickly on Facebook Live, a bit longer on BizTalk Radio. Stay with us on Garden America. Back to the program. Thank you for tuning in on uh, BizTalk Radio. Those still watching, a lot of people here on uh, Facebook Live. And uh, Greg, our apologies. I had to take that break to pay some bills. But uh, please pick up, continue where we left off with this Rose Morgan Hill. Great. Um, and while I'm doing that, um, we're going to move next to Nigret. Okay. Um, but uh, Morgan Hill um, was purchased by a group in Morgan Hill, who, a, a historic preservation group, who wanted a rose from the period of the time that the town um, got its start. And um, this, this corresponds to that time in the early 20th century. So we, we provided a, a planting of Morgan Hill Red in Morgan Hill. The, this next one is a, a stunning rose, Nigrette. Um, it goes by a couple of other names, but I won't confuse people with those, those names. But um, it, it's uh, called the Black Rose of Sangerhausen. Um, it was introduced by um, an American who introduced some very interestingly colored roses. Um, it's a small flower on a very small plant. Even budded, it's just modest in its, in its size. I think it's the most perfect rose to grow in a great big terracotta pot. Um, it blooms nonstop. It has a delicate uh, damask fragrance. But it's these flowers that are usually black when they first open. Um, from black to cream, we'll move to Richard E. West. And this is a rose that is the epitome of what I was talking about a few minutes ago, um, my love for cream to pale yellow colored roses. Often they are roses that start white and fade to cream or vice versa. They start yellow and um, they start white and fade to, and, and enrich into yellow or fade. Um, it, it's just a beautiful garden plant, a fairly big, robust um, plant, certainly overhead height with large flowers, very fragrant and and incredibly productive. In have, fact, in my go ahead. I was just going to say I have to thank you for telling me about this rose too, because I had mentioned to you how much I liked the rose Sir Henry Seagrave, yeah. and you told me, well, if you like that rose, you definitely need Richard E. West. Yeah, it's a joy. It's in a, a part of my garden. <clears throat> much of my garden is now gone, and the gophers have taken whole swaths of it. But it lies alone in the middle of a bed that was planted with 50 other roses. It's the only survivor. It's six feet tall, and it's never stopped blooming. So I guess the gophers don't even like it. <laughs> <laughs> no gopher bitters in the auction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to give you one last, and that is one of my heartthrobs, which is the St. Helena Cemetery, very double HT. And that picture is amazing. For those of you that are following along on Facebook, you see the picture. For those of you listening on the radio, go over to our website and yeah. you can get a link to the video. Yeah, that's GardenAmerica.com. And um, this, ro this, ro this photo was given to us by Debbie Peterson, um, who's one of our supporters. And um, she just recently took this from a plant that she got from us. Um, it, it is an amazing rose. We found this in the St. Saint, Saint Helena Cemetery in Napa. In, uh, up in the wine country. Uh, it's a beautiful old cemetery with very few roses that have now survived. Um, this rose probably dates from um, the, the turn of the century. And Etienne Bourret, who's a great um, knowledgeable Bavarian in France, believes that this may be a rose called Mademoiselle Helene Cambier, introduced in 1895. And that was one of Joseph Pernay Duchet, his roses. And he was the, the origin of the Pernetiana or Pernay roses. I love it. Um, it has over 100 petals. Uh, the flowers aren't massive, but they're nice size. And it's incredibly fragrant. So if you can get your hands on this rose, you're lucky. It will not be available probably in the future very much. All right, Greg, lots of great yeah. information on all of the roses. And 
you know, again, this was just the tip of the iceberg. How many roses are listed for the auction there? You Jim? know, I forget now, but I think it's about 170. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. If I have it up yeah. here still. And, and Greg, I know that uh, you have uh, further duties to go as soon as you get off air here. <laughs> and is uh, your sale still going on if people are interested, or is it finished? Yeah, our... Uh... I kind of push our sale as a sale that is limited. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all uh, virtual with, except for the pickup of plants. And it, it, it just, it's whatever we still have in stock, which is a lot right now, uh, continues to be available for people to purchase. Um, but they do have to pick them up. They do have to pick them up. Okay. We are actually delivering roses to Southern California in 10 days. Oh, when, we're, when we come to visit you and bring you your roses. Um, oh, all right. So we're we're bringing orders of roses down to Southern California, and there's still time for that. Well, that's good to know. Tiger, you want to make your list? Boom! I'm <laughs> working on it right now. So how do how do people find that list, Greg? Uh, on our website, which is the Friends of Vintage Roses dot org. Okay. And there's a page called Rose Sale. Pretty simple to find. Rose Sale. Um, the the current listing is slightly um, out of date, but um, uh, it'll it, it'll suffice. All right, beautiful, well, Greg. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I, I know how busy you are, but uh, you've shared with our audience information that uh, also is very rare and in danger yeah. of extinction. So we really do appreciate it. Thank you. It was great to be with you guys. All right, you bet. Take care. Take care, Greg. Yeah, yeah. If this doesn't excite you, then what can I say? You know, you, really, seriously. You don't like roses, and you don't deserve to have any in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> is, that what, is that what you were trying to well, say? You know, maybe in a roundabout way. Oh. But uh, again, so there's an example of, like you say, roses that either don't exist anymore. They're not going to exist. They're they're in danger. How many times do you have the opportunity to get one? That's right. Right, and. Greg was mainly talking about his favorite group, uh, old hybrid teas and right. Pernettianas. But if you go to the auction list, you'll find many new roses. As a matter of fact, one rose that was just introduced last year is the featured rose called the Iron Throne. And that was uh, hybridized by our buddy Chris Greenwood. Absolutely. And, and, and you said we go to our website as well, John, for some of these roses that we have or not. What do we have on our website right now? Tiger, you, no. If we go not on it, our website, on our website, if you you can link over to heirloom roses, right? Where oh, not want... not any of these roses right. that we're mentioning, but no, there but are heirloom. other varieties that we do suggest. Right. So do yes. go to gardenamerica.com. John, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and finish your thoughts. Okay. And uh, yeah, a lot of people tuned in this morning. We do appreciate that. Uh, very, it's you know, some of this is just incredible. So I hope that you've had a chance to let it soak in in terms of what we're all about and what the California Coastal Rose Society is doing to save these roses. And a big thank you to Greg Lowry. With that in mind, uh, both on Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live, we're going to take a break. We have two more segments coming up, so do stay with us. And uh, now's a great time to post your questions, your comments on the topics this morning, roses, or something else as we continue here on Garden America. We have returned, at least returned to the airwaves here on Facebook Live and Biz Talk Radio. Thank you again for tuning in. Be sure to go to GardenAmerica.com, like our Facebook page, go to our YouTube page, which is also Garden America Radio. That's our YouTube channel. Watch all previous shows, like and subscribe. Three main places, our YouTube page, Facebook page, and, of course, our website, GardenAmerica.com. Back to you, John, if you can recall what you were talking about before the break. Well, I was just looking at uh, a few questions we have on Facebook, and Rick in Star, Idaho. He brings up a good question, though. He says, in breeding roses, we think of the flowers. But are there other aspects of the plant that breeders also concentrate on, like the leaves, et cetera? So if you're going to show a rose, and I think in the past you've told me, um, what is it, six weeks before the actual uh, showing of the rose? John, is that when you start? 
If you if you want a rose to be in bloom, Full you bloom. cut it back six weeks before you want the blooms. And and judges are looking at not just the petals, but what else in that rose? Well, judges are looking at uh, if you go to a rose show, typically what it's called um, exhibition form, which is a high centered flower. Uh, not very many of the old hybrid teas would fit into that category, though a lot of rose shows have what's called a decorative class. So what about the leaves, as we've well, talked about? How I've always thought that people could, and at one time Ping was, Ping Lim, our buddy, was doing this, but not doing it anymore, breeding for different colored leaves, like Blue leaves. Wow. You know, gray leaves. Really? Yeah, they had leaves with like a little bit of iridescence to yeah. right. as well. Yeah. Right. But they're not really doing that anymore. They're pretty much now uh, concentrating on, as we mentioned before, disease resistance. Mm -hmm. um, though uh, I agree with Greg. I haven't Takes the fragrance out. I haven't sprayed my roses in the last two years, and they all look great right now. Um, the... Uh, of course, that doesn't work if you are an exhibitor and you want to have <laughs> perfect roses. You're not probably going to win unless you. I've always you liked spray. a good, deep, strong leaf on a rose. Well, that that's one thing. If they are breeding for leaves, um, it's accidental uh, because the glossier that a leaf is, the shinier. Usually, the more disease resistance. Really? So, okay. Interesting. So um, while they're breeding for disease resistance, they do end up with really shiny leaves. I have some roses at home that um, you would buy almost just because the leaves were so glossy. Yeah. They kind of look like Caprosma. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting walking through John's roses. As you're walking through the roses, you get, a, I mean, aside from the flowers, but that's an obvious difference. Right. But the foliage itself, like you're saying, like a deep green glossy one, you can have kind of a a lime green smaller one you can yeah. have ones that are dull with a finish you have ones that are glossy right. some red you know and different things like that it's it's you you really get to see the whole spectrum of foliage as you're walking through john's roses for sure and um uh, another thing that ro that breeders were working on but they find out that people really don't care for anymore is thornless roses mm -hmm. Uh, there was one breeder, Harvey Davidson, that came up with a whole group of thornless roses, and they they never really sold that well. I you know I everybody might care says now and then. everybody says you know I want a thornless rose, but what they well, really want is a flower that smells good. Yeah, and I think they took it a bit to the extreme because I I could deal with a rose, a standard rose. The the, the thornless that I want though, or what what is that rose? The robusta is that? The one that has like a ton of thorns down the sides or rugosa or oh the rugosa rose. rugosa yeah. right where you just you can't touch any part of and, the and stem they're big and they're thick you know I mean, without, nasty without looking thorns. touching a rose those ones i stay away from i won't buy that one just yeah. because of the now, as i recall green planet doesn't have any thorns a lot of florist roses don't yeah, yeah. for obvious reasons uh, when they're breeding for mm -hmm. florist roses they do try to get roses that are mostly thornless so is it silly that when i cut off a a rose that has a lot of thorns to bring into the house i i take the snippers and i cut the ends off all the thorns no it's not silly <laughs> they're easier to arrange well that's you know if you have gloves on you can actually and there's not that many you they can even sell flick little devices off. like a, it's called a thorn stripper you john strip or i mean brian yeah well yeah. i don't have one of those i one two three <laughs> four five I saw Brian's ears perk up when you were talking about a thorn stripper. <laughs> exactly. The um, our buddy Ping Lim had told me years ago when we were on a I think we were on a panel discussion. We were talking about roses, and someone asked him about uh, if he was breeding thornless roses, and he said that he thought the thorns were part of the character of each rose. And if you look at roses, there's different thorns on different roses. And he thought that was all part of their personality and yeah. their character. And I kind of agree with sure. that. They only become a problem when they bite you. <laughs> well, I have one rose called Horida or Horido. And, you know, which is horrid, right? Yeah. yeah. Sounds and already you can imagine what the thorns look like on that. Rose. And I like roses that, that have... <laughs> 
a lot of thorns they, they, or they unusual very aggressive, looking thorns. Very aggressive yeah. looking. Yeah, they, they are kind of aggressive. So anyway, th those are some of the things that they're working on. Um, they also uh, would be, if this might fit into Rick's question, they work on, on height. Mm -hmm. You know, roses that are compact, uh, roses that are climbers, climbers. Um, you know, miniatures, different groups of roses. So yeah, there's a lot going on in, in roses and in flowers. They, you know, they're always working on color. Greg was mentioning some of the roses that are out today. You know, right now, probably the most famous group of roses or most sought after are the Dave Bang hybrids. And Dave has uh, in-your-face stripes in his roses. Yeah. You know, dark purple with hot pink stripes and uh, similar to your Simsala Bim, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, by the way, it does work to cut the yellow ones. Oh, why well, the next ones came up? Yeah, striped. Yeah, actually, I got two. I got a striped and a and a yellow. But the the point is, when I did start cutting the yellows, I got more stripes. Do you know that I on that particular rose at one time I had the striped, the pure yellow, and a black. On the wow. same. On the same. Yeah, because that will also sport into a black rose. I, I've only had the yellow and the striped, not yeah. the black yet. It's so, yeah. Is that how they get that kind of more burgundy? Is they go darker? With the with the reddish color, because I mean, Sims Alabim, it's kind of like that yellow with a more of a burgundy color, right? Right, it's a burgundy, yeah. Right. right. So, in order to get that burgundy, does the real flower have to almost be black? No, because the or... real flower is yellow. Oh, okay. Pure yellow. Pure yellow. Right. It's okay. a rose called Frisco, and all those that group of striped roses from Germany, Sims Alabim, mm -hmm. Hocus Pocus, Abracadabra. Phidibus, they all came from that sports of that yellow rose, which is very unstable. Okay. Yeah. So, it's like some people you know, right? I was going to say it kind of fits into some <laughs> people who are trying to uh, grow Greg roses. Greg didn't mention one of the roses. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting. And do you are you familiar with it, John? The, and I look at it, and I, I want to say tarantula. Oh, well, you know, that's what it means in English. Is that... Because Are you going to bring it up and show Yeah, us? I'm going to bring it up right now. The rose. How do you say it? Tarantella. Tarantella. Tarantella is an Italian folk dance. Oh, does it mean tarantula? And it means tarantula right. because the movements to the dance are kind of spider-like. Spidery? Yeah. Now, one thing that struck me in this rose, it's a, a yellow, um, I don't know, yellow cream Yeah, there's some rose. cream on the end. Um, it almost looks a little bit, you know, roses have more of a pointed petal. These ones look mm. a little bit lobed, and it could be the, just the photo. I don't know, but um, they it was are a more rounded. Different. Yeah, they, they are round. Yeah, and it's one of the Pernettianas that okay. he was talking about. Um, again, that usually I can't remember Tarantella, and now that I can't smell anymore, I don't know if it's <laughs> fragrant. But you see. could look it up and see. But most of the the Pernettiana roses have that fragrance that. Greg was saying you'll only get if you have one of those types of roses. So, John, I, what is what is the connection between trying to breed roses that are disease resistant, but at the same time now you're breeding out the fragrance? What is the correlation there? There really isn't a correlation, and the new breeding now is uh, focused on fragrance again. Yeah. Okay. Good. You know, a lot of David Austin's roses are extremely fragrant and popular because they are so fragrant. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time they thought that the fragrance gene was related to the disease gene, uh, the, like for mildew. So they thought that, uh, if a rose was really fragrant, it would mildew easily. Mm. And that, came from the fact that there were some fragrant roses, red roses especially, that came from one particular cross that were very fragrant but all got mildew. We're going to take a break. We have one more segment coming up. Keep watching. Lots to come here in our final segment here, both on BizTalk Radio and Facebook Live, as uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Go to our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and, of course, GardenAmerica.com. Coming back after these messages on BizTalk Radio.
Good show, great show is in terms of, of just something different for you to get a chance to look at all those roses and Greg giving us a history as we continue. And we are in our final segment. Still a lot of people tuned in, both on BizTalk Radio and Facebook Live. For, for the rose uh, aficionados and uh, students of roses that are out there, I just want to mention that we do know that thorns are properly called prickles. Okay. Yeah, and you get pricked by them. That's right. So, yeah. but everyone calls rose thorns thorns. So, well, we like to talk in in lay language sometimes. Right. Yeah. That's. Uh, we want to make you feel comfortable. Prickle. prickle. I feel weird saying prickle. You feel weird saying it over the air? No, I just feel weird saying it in general. Prickle. Prickle. What about pickle? I I, I don't have a problem saying pickle. It's like the I've R. It. I've I've really never used prickle in talking. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I told told you that I was pricked by a rose, and John <laughs> said, "Well, actually, that's the correct uh, yeah correct way to say it. It is. You get pricked, right? So by if you don't prickle. want to get pricked, then don't go out into the garden or don't get a rose that has thorns." <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Rick wants to know how long it takes to breed a new rose. Wouldn't uh, that, two three years? That'd right? be what was it? depending on the rose, John, or it depends it, what you mean by breed. I mean, I mean from it, start to finish, the, the breeding. <laughs> itself takes about uh 10 seconds <laughs> uh, but i think he means to introduce a new rose yeah and to introduce a new rose is roughly seven years wow but today with the internet because you know brian we've talked about this before that if you if you grow a rose from seed and the seed germinates it only takes six weeks to mm -hmm. flower mm -hmm. right six to 12 weeks and the rose is blooming. It's not that you have to wait years and years like with some plants to see what the flower is gonna look like. So uh, you can see the bloom early on, but then through all the testing it goes through, if it's gonna be commercially viable, you know, it's gotta be tested in different parts of the country to see if it's disease resistant. So it's the red, it's the red tape, it's everything. It's the administrative it's the part of breeding. Tape. So that could be about yeah. seven years. But with the internet, you can have a small breeder or a private breeder uh, that can see a rose, like it, and uh, start making cuttings and offering it up, you know, the next year. Mm. Yeah. So it they just, just won't be able to have, like you're saying, the history of it, meaning they won't be able to tell you how tolerant it is. Or, and you know, the main thing is they won't be able to make any money on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it always comes down to that. Because you need to go through the process. You know, Chris yeah. Greenwood, our buddy, uh, now has the most famous exhibition, or I should say the most sought after exhibition rose in the United States, which is Ring of Fire. And uh, it took him a number of years and several growers testing the rose and, and saying, we're not gonna grow it before it finally got introduced. And I would say that it's probably uh, rose societies and rose shows showing that rose that made it popular because mm -hmm. once it started winning trophies, Everybody wants it. Oh, them. gee, now we want it. Now yeah. we're interested. Yeah, where can I get one of those? And then you, you with the internet, you've got Facebook uh, um, uh, groups. That's what they're called, yes, right? Yes, groups. You've yes. got groups, and you go on, and people are saying, hey, do you know where I can get this, or do you know where I could get that? Mm -hmm. So anyway, the the in general, it's seven years for a good rose to get introduced, but it can happen more quickly. I think we're caught up on the questions. Comments? I think we're caught up on the questions. Um, I have plenty of comments. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Let's get to your comments. There was, um, there are, there is some breeding going on with different species right now, and Ping is starting to do that also. And when he was working with colored leaves, he was especially doing that. You know, Rosa glauca is a rose that has kind of bluish leaves of species and trying to breed that into modern roses. But there's, uh, since most of today's roses come from only a few species, maybe 11 species out of 150 species worldwide, there's a lot of, a lot of different characteristics that could still be bred into roses. Um, the, the Kifsgate rose is a species rose that was collected and I don't know if a lot of breeding has been done with Kifsgate. Only, only for large, large uh, 
countries can they the, breed that rose? The first thing I would do would probably be to cross it with C, <laughs> which smallest. is the world's smallest rose. Just to bring it down uh, into a moderate. Pedro bring it rose. down, yeah. Yeah, bring uh, it down to 12 feet yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. So you have to remember, though, that that rose was, what, getting oh. like 80 years old or something yeah, I mean, like that. Yeah, and, I'm, so, and it was probably to the point where they hadn't pruned it back yeah. in, in 40 years because it was just unmanageable, right? Yeah. Um, now, you know, we, we, we talk about these roses in their, their past and where they're at. And we talked about some of these are very unique and rare. Um, you know, I want to kind of get back to the society from the standpoint of there's a lot of groups out there like what Greg and like what you work with on saving these roses. Um, you know, for our listeners that maybe aren't familiar with it, what kinds of things do this, does the society do? that help save roses, you know, I mean, besides from breeding more of them. And you have two minutes, John. <laughs> well, one of the roses uh, that are, you know, Greg was talking about Pedro Dot roses, and there's this garden in Barcelona that has a collection of Pedro Dot roses and also uh, Nadal Kim Pruby, who is a breeder around the same time. But one of the roses they did not have and was extinct in Europe was a rose called Mari Dot. And they contacted me to see if they could get one of those roses. And when John and Becky Hook were here from France last week, I gave them a Mari Dot rose to take back to France. And now they they're have in southern in France near Barcelona. So, Perfect. so they'll be able to su supply that back to the collection. So now people visiting that rose garden can see that rose that's been gone from Europe for, what, maybe the last 50 years. Yeah. Wow. Hey, that All is going right. to do it. Uh, still hanging in there strong with our viewers right now. Thank you for tuning in to this special show. Hope you learned some things about roses, and hope, hopefully you're going to uh, do some bidding and to help the California Coastal Rose Society save the roses in 2021 into 2022. For the entire crew, I want to thank our guest, uh, Greg Lowry, for being with us today, talking about roses. A lot of information. Tiger Palafox, I'm Brian Maine, the Hall of Famer, John Bagnasco. Until we get together next week, that'll be Saturday morning at 8.06 Pacific, 11.06 Eastern Time Zone. Have a safe weekend and a safe week as we do it again next week here on Garden America. Take care.